Right, hello, I thought um, I'd do another one of my videos and the one I'm going to um, discuss tonight, I might do more than one video on it's about um, a film actor that I've been watching on YouTube um, name's Jim Carrey and some years ago he made this film uh, called Bruce Almighty uh, that I actually saw uh, most people thought it was very funny and it was all about fun. Well, to be quite honest with you, I was, I was quite moved by it, particularly the end part. But I want to tell you why. Um, Jim Carrey is a guy that plays this character who is very funny, over-the-top funny. Uh, but really, there's a serious sign underneath. And um, most people probably don't know this, that when this video is going out on YouTube, I've was born premature, I've got Asperger's Syndrome. I'm also quite hyperactive, I don't sleep very much anyway. Now apparently this Jim Carrey was diagnosed with ADHD anyway. And I was one of these people, very similar to him, I always like to make people laugh and I thought if I wasn't making someone laugh um, then I wasn't going to be anyone because that's the only thing I could do is just really um do voiceovers and do things like that. And I was actually quite good, actually. I, I did make a lot of people laugh. Um, but one of my friends in, in one of the local churches I belonged to some years ago, his name was Mark, he said, Jeff, can I have a word with you? He said, why are you the doing the jester for when it's not you? And I thought, that's funny. And I thought, well, this guy doesn't know me very well. He hasn't been around very long. Um, I'll just pretend that I know what he's on about when I don't really care or know really. He said, you're a deep man that knows things that very few, a lot of people don't know yet. And, and I think you should be doing that, your destiny, rather than trying to impress people by being the center of attention all the time. He said, you don't need that anyway. You're the man of the quiet things, the things that people wouldn't give a second thought to. And it's quite funny, I know that most of my life I was that person. But years, because I had um, a learning disability as well as ADHD at the time, I was sent away to school. And I saw this guy on the TV, it was very, very funny, everybody liked him. And I thought, well, if I was more like him, then I'd be more acceptable. Because I was, uh, you know, I was much into my head. I spent half the time with my head somewhere else and my body there, you know. Americans call it remote viewing, where... People on the autism spectrum are born into that. We do it all the time. We just call it dreaming while awake. And anyway, um, about a year later, I left that church and I went to live with a, a lady friend I had in Ireland. And this film, this thing was on my mind while I was over there. And at the end of the film, it was quite funny because this is the, th the thing that kept affecting me in the eye department, <laughs> he usually does, uh, that he realised um, that he'd made a fool of himself and what it was, he had God's powers for a week. He said God was doing a terrible job, he wasn't getting what he wanted and the world was a mess. So God said, well you have my powers for a week and I'll come back and see how you're getting on. And at the end he realised he made a mess and he hadn't seen his girlfriend he'd fallen out with because he turned into such an idiot getting everything he wanted and messing up the world and he just made himself into a, a, an idiot, nobody, his girlfriend didn't want to know, he was self-centred, egotistical and his girlfriend called him that and she walked out on him and at the end of the film he suddenly realised what he'd done and he goes, where's Grace? So his head's there and it's quite funny because I can do that with my head as well and he, he freaks out and he, he runs across the road and, and says to God, I give up. And is hit by this 10 ton truck and ends up in heaven before God. And it's quite funny, he wasn't the only, only one that was hit by a 10 ton truck that night because I was. It came out of the TV and hit me there because I suddenly came to the, that realisation. But I didn't really know what to do about the realisation that... Um, you have to be true to God and you have to be true to yourself and to others because the game's up. And when you realise the game's up, you're just not living a lie. And it's the same as what um, um, 
Wayne Dyer says, what's truth in the morning by the afternoon is become a, become a lie. And you have to move from the, from the ego part of your life to the meaning part. And he said it usually follows the quantum moment. Uh, I call it the download. It happened to me about two years after I saw that film. And I know this is what, I think what Jim Carrey has had. I know that Wayne Dyer has had it. Um, I was up on the field and I was talking to God. I talk to God like the Jews do, like a person. I said, I can't connect with people. So I have to um, act like I'm not to bring it on. And I said, it's not very good. And um, I don't know what I'm going to do. And something came back to me that I, I needed sort of like a, a, I call it a spiritual infusion. I call it a download, call it what you will. And I said, well, I'll have it all in one go. And something came back to me. I was up on top of this hill going for a walk. You don't know what you're asking. It was really quite clear. And I said, well, I'll have it anyway and get it over with. And it's like energy poured from the sky. I could see me. And I was the stars and the stars were me. I could think and be there. And things, it felt afterwards, I couldn't touch any part of me. It was really quite odd. I went to bed that night. I was never loved as a baby because I was given up as a baby. And I was adopted when I was two years old. And it was like I was that again. And if I touched myself, it was like electricity. I couldn't touch anything. It was like all the nerves were on me outside. And that lasted for about three or four days. And then I had this breakdown, this turn I had. And I was really quite blown for about three years. And a couple of years after that, I was put in a leadership, service leadership, because I like to serve people in the church. I'm verger, dog's body, I call myself anything else. I sing as well and I play bells, play handbells and I do photography and it's funny because one of the things that I asked many many years ago when I, when I first came back from Ireland, God or Source or Spirit, I mean I call him God, um, people have different names, I said I need to know what's wrong with me and I need to know what other people need. So if I met people like me and I knew who they were then I'd be able to be successful doing the thing that you want me to do rather than trying to become something I'm not anyway. And it's funny what, what happened afterwards. Um, I, I met um, a couple of years ago, I met this, um, this, this lad in a shop and he was with his mum and I went up and I said, hello. I said, I'm not the only one that's got Asperger's autism here and I said to her I said how's the bowels and she looked at me with her eyes lit up she said I don't think I know what you know about that I said his bowels leak and I said well that girl sat on that play horse is your daughter she's a great thing because she doesn't speak because she doesn't need to she's all head your husband over there is a bookworm he's, he's a, uh, a really a researcher and this lady said you walked in off the street, I've never been in this town before, and you've got everything right. And I said, I knew when I came in here, I just opened my mouth and the things came out I had to say. I wasn't really, I suppose, in control of it at the time. Uh, the other time, I call it seeing somewhere else. Um, when my father died, I was given some money and I bought this camera and a couple of other things. And I went into this bank, because I wanted to buy a camera but I was carrying cash around and I put things down and I can't remember where I put it so I said to this lady I'll oh, put this in because Aspie Jeff will put it down and won't find it and she goes that's funny my son's got that I said and I was there I was in her living room my head was there and all I saw was this lad he went to the corner of the room uh, put his head down and his hands and put his feet up against the wall like he's standing on his head but not quite and getting high and then running around. I said, oh, don't worry about him running to the wall and putting his feet up there and head down. We all get the download. And she said, how the blinking hell do you know about that? And I said, I was just there. And the same thing happened um, um, some years ago. Um, one, one of my friends was pregnant and um, I went up to her and touched her hand. All I got was this massive pink, massive light. 
And I said, oh, I said, it looks like a pink one thou hast. I said something silly like that. And I was washing up in the sink. It was on, it was on the middle of the week. It was half past one, I think it was. All I saw was this baby being held. Oh, she's come then. And I was in the hospital and all I could see was she was dressed in white, the baby. Now I told mum to get rid of the blue stuff and take the pink stuff because she bought blue as well. I said, you don't need it. She said, well, we don't know what it is. We're calling it boy girl. I said, you can't call her that. I mean, how would you like to be called something like that? You'll have to give her a name. And um, I was at the hospital with my head. And all I saw was I'd pull the blind down and watch this car going down the road. It was a green, low slung car, like an Audi or um, an SL compressor or something. It was that kind of thing. It was an old one. It was in pretty poor condition and the rubber was hanging off by the window. And it was green. It was a colour like limes. And I happened to say this to her and she just looked and wondered what was going on. And... One of my friends many years ago uh, was was saying um, he didn't really know the effect of, of what I was on about. And I said, well, neither do I. That's why I've come to speak to you, because I, I, I don't know what's going on. And he said, if something like that happens again, let me know it did to him. And um, that's the kind of things that goes on. When you have the download, everything, everything, get, your whole life gets turned upside down. I mean, I became a Christian about, I was 29, I think I was. It might have been before I got briefly interested in the Billy Graham thing. But um, it's quite funny because my, my life really was turned upside down because I was adopted and it, it didn't really work out very well. And I ended up... Um, more or less back in care. I was um, left home, went to live in a hostel. I was a really young man, but I was not well enough to look after myself. So I went to live with an ex-foster mum, a very clever lady, and um, and got to know her. And this lady one day, I, I didn't know who she was. She was in. We went to Bristol shopping, and this lady came up, and uh, she touched my hands. I said, what's going on? She said, you better look after those hands because God's going to use those people going to get healed through those hands. And I said, I'm not into God. He hasn't served me in any way. So Fox trot off. Well, about 10 years later, I, I became a Christian 10 years after that. Um, I met a chap called Alan. And uh, he had a daughter. She had something wrong here. Well, she used to come up put her hand in my hands there. A couple of minutes later she was running around. And uh, he said, uh, come on, he said, Jeff, he said, I want to speak to you. Uh, I'll make you a drink in the kitchen. So I went along there. He said, I want to tell you a story. Do you remember when that woman in Bristol came up? I said, I don't really know what you know about that. He said, I just saw it in my head. I, I, he said, you're going to have to ask your one mum I said about it. Uh, because he said, that kid's been old twice and she's come and sat on you and put her hands on She's perfectly fine. And I thought, hmm. So I went up and spoke to her. And she said, oh, yes. She said, I've known about it. That was coming for about 10 years. But the point is, you wouldn't accept it. You always argued about it. She said, it's happened, doesn't it? I said, yeah. I said, yes, it has. I, I wasn't expecting it. It's just one of those things. And it's really quite odd. I mean... I've met people that have been ill with cancer, I know. Uh, one of my friends had um, liver cancer. Um, I went up to him. I knew what he had. I didn't want to upset him. I didn't say nothing. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm not very well with the middle. I, I've got to go for tests on sometime next week. And um, about a week later, I saw his wife quite upset and I saw him and he was very upset as well. So I went up, I said, what's wrong? He said, I've got terminal bowel cancer, I've got three months to live, I've been told. I said, yes, well, I know about the cancer, I knew last week. He said, you can't have known last week. I didn't know it on Wednesday, so well, I did, I knew Sunday. Um, I'll pray for you and see how you get on.
And he goes, well, you can't do anything because I'm going to die in three months. I said, no, I, no, you're not. I said, um, I'll see you, pray for you, and I'll talk to you again about it in the next two or three years. And then where? Well, he lived for four years, didn't he? And uh, I remember his wife's had just lost her parents, lost her mum and her dad. Lawrence went down really quick, and uh, he was given, believe it or not, three days he was given. They sent him home, he was full of fluid, couldn't do anything. It had gone bad, it had, and uh, that, that's what, what he had. So his wife wanted to do the nurse, and they had a, a Macmillan nurse up there. And I realised it ain't time yet, because her parents had just died, she's not going to cope with this. So I heard he was in hospital. Uh, it does say in the Bible, go and pray for sick people, lay hands on them. I said, right. So I left here. It was pouring down with rain. I didn't take an umbrella. And this rain was sheeting down. And I was walking up the hill. I said, if this guy doesn't live another six months, I quit. I finished. And I got up there in the hospital. They'd, they'd sent him home to die, apparently. And something came up to me, it's done. And so um, I got home. 48 hours later, they went out having a meal, went shopping. He was supposed to be dead. He was supposed to be dead on the Friday. Uh, he lived for another six months. And um, this is the kind of thing that, that's been going on. Because when you become what you're supposed to, um, like Jim Carrey says, the ego tries to trip you into making you want what you've already got. I call it looking for the great white. Uh, you're never going to find it because it's already there. Because uh, when you live out of ego, you're never ever going to be able to find what's right for you because the ego just becomes your oppressor. It's not going to work. Um, I remember Wayne Dyer saying that the ego is the the untrue self and it control if it controls your life we all learn that we are what our job is or we are what the people think and the ego really sets us up for a fall um, because what's truth in the morning has become a lie in the evening and it's quite funny in a way because a lot of people may not have got it but because I've been living it for so long, I, I would say it seems to be the right shape. And I spoke to a number of my family and friends, they don't understand it. And I thought, why don't they understand it when... I went to three special schools, I'm dyslexic, it's called me retard, why am I understanding this and they're not? Because I want everybody to understand this, because it's important for them, not for me, I don't want it for me. And I thought to myself, it's because they're not ready yet. I wasn't ready, it just happened when I least expected it and I was there. And I remember a gentleman on the internet, he was doing a video about, uh, they call it indigo children, children that are different. He said most of these children are with ADD or dyslexic or they've got Asperger's syndrome. He said they've got more brain cells and they experience life in a different way. They access the data of life we can't access because we don't know how. And it was quite funny because I had a guy I knew many years ago, he um, did a number of business A-levels in university. And he came up and spoke to me and said exactly the, the same thing, that um, I had access to things that other people didn't. But it wasn't my time to tell because the time wasn't yet. This guy is now running a church, he's over in Russia. So um, when I saw that, I realised um, what, was, what was going on. And I watched a video the other night. And it was about brain scans that they've done with children on the spectrum. That uh, you've got nearly twice as many brain cells after the, a certain age, I think it's 7 to 14. Brain cells begin to die and about a third of your brain cells die. They said what happens with these children is the brain cells don't die, they keep them. And they said the only way to get rid of the autism, they're always talking about curing, it's not a bloody disease anyway, it's a consciousness, it makes me furious, it really does. And 
He said, we can cure these people by killing off their brain cells. They're, they're absolutely evil, these people. They really are. And they have no idea what they're, they're messing with. And I get very angry. And it's not their fault. They just don't understand. What a lot of people don't realise about autism spectrum, ADHD, is we're a community. Uh, very similar to the hundredth monkey, what 5% learns everyone can do. So say if 5% learn to to dream and send their head halfway around the world, after five percent reach that the rest do it too. And I've been questioning old people on the spectrum and today a young boy of nine, he's doing exactly the same thing as me, he's nine years old. And um and he's a lovely little lad, I've known him since he was three. And he's young for his age. And he sat he's got this cuddle object, it's a donkey, he's had it since he was a baby, he's always chewing it. And I said to his mum, it's a form of stimulation, a sort of meditation. I said, you know when you're spaced out doing that, you're not really here, you're not really there. I said, where'd you go? And I said, well, I'll tell you where I go. And he goes, oh, that's for me too. And I said, I met this lady in the room. Oh, she said, I start pacing up and down, not really with it, and that's I could be anywhere. And there's a lady in America, and I think she lives in America, Lyrica, another lady that lives in Canada. And I thought, something's going on here. And I said, we're here for a purpose. And for people in America to refer to it as disease control, that we've got to be controlled and cured by some kind of medication. And I like to shove that medication where the place sun don't shine. They have no idea what's going on. I said, we're put here because we're supposed to be here. And to treat us like we're some kind of disease that needs to be cured. It is People like me find it extremely offensive. And I know the parents are confused and they want that. And that's understandable. But the point is, you do wish for another life. And when you have a child with ADHD or Asperger's or autism. But there comes a time when you have to say, look, it's not real. I'm going to have to live by the now because it's not right for me to change it. God's trusted me with this individual life and I've got to make the best of it. Uh, and when you do that, you'll be surprised how it frees you. There was a lady on the internet, had a little boy who, who doesn't speak. And one day she decided by the kitchen sink she was washing up. And she decided she was going to have an affair with another man because she wasn't getting on with her husband. She said, I've only ever heard his voice a few times. He does talk, but he doesn't talk very often. But I recognise his voice. And you know when you think you shouldn't do something and it's your own voice? Well, it, this time it wasn't. And I was imagining going out with this other guy and getting quite away with myself. Next minute I heard, no! And when I turned around, this kid was going... No, you don't. She said, I went flipping where? He flipping you. And I said, and, and this is quite quite a common thing that happens. I remember um, when friends of mine have died, um, very good friends of mine, my father, my mum in particular has died. My nephew, one of my nephews died. I actually went there and I was there when they died. And I was actually here and they died 40 miles, but my head was there. And so I said to my sister that when Dad died, he was on his own. You'd gone out of the room, the chair was empty. When you came back, he was already dead. You put your hand out and touched him. My sister said, I don't think I know about that. I said, it was 10 to 11. She goes, yes, I know. And she couldn't understand how I knew. And, uh, it's the same when my mother died. Uh, Jeff, I said, I said, I know Mum's gone. She went 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, whatever it was. How the bloody hell do you know about that? And I said, there was a nurse with her, stroking the flat of her hair. She said, well, if you saw her, would you recognise her? I said, yes, I probably would. And, um, and my brother-in-law took me out, picking leaves, picking berries off trees. Next minute, I'm there five years ago. And I saw this lady walking around, quite distressed. And I said, Bernard, there used to be a lady here that was always very distressed. She died here. Yes, she killed herself five years ago. There's no record, and I've never been there. 
And this is the kind of thing, when you become you, and you don't care what people think anymore, the real gifts and the real you can shine through. And if people laugh at you, or think you're mad, it's their problem. Because the ego always tells you, I've got to impress other people and be what other people want me to be. But when you give that, you can move into the real you and the real things you're meant to do. And that's what I say to people, be what you're meant to do. Don't be what other people want you to do. And I say this to parents, don't try to make your children like you. Let them be like them. They've got their own compass, let them follow it. Anyway, I think I'm going to um, end this because I've got about a couple of minutes. But one of my Christian friends said that once. Never put yourself on your children and ex expectations. Let them follow their own dreams. And I think that's true of everyone there. I remember um, um, Tony Atwood was saying, if you're a rich accountant crying in your limousine because you want to be an artist, he said, sell the car and buy some paintbrushes because you're not being true to yourself. And I think you've got to be true to God and true to yourself. Other people will come round when they see what's happened to you. And uh, at first I think you're crazy. But I mean, eventually they'll come round. It, it's happened for me.